Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. Well, the wait is over. Carrie, Miranda, Samantha, and Charlotte are back. Being a mother is hard. I needed a break. We bump into each other halfway around the world, and it means something. I think you're playing with fire. Something happened. deal ages ago. Man, babies, doesn't matter. We're soulmates. A Jasmine and Aladdin? Yes, sweetie, but with cocktails. And joining us today is the one man who has all four women talking in his head at once. Michael Patrick King has been writing and producing Sex and the City since 1998 and directed Sex and the City 2, which opens everywhere on May 27th. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Dove, which I'm sure all the girls use. Hello there. Hi, everybody loves Dove. <laughs> Release the Dove. Yeah. How you doing? I am so excited to be here. I'm so excited to let it go and you, let everybody see it. How long have you been working on this movie? I think about 14 years. <laughs> no, no, really? I mean, literally, this movie, well, the sequel was, the first movie was two years ago. And when we finished it, I had nothing up my sleeve. It wasn't like, oh, now we're going to do the Abu Dhabi adventure. No, it was, so it's less than two years. But from beginning to end, here we are. It's freshly done. We just finished editing it like three weeks ago. And was it hard to convince everybody, because obviously it's the ultimate ensemble cast, that, that you know, to do it again, to, to jump in the again. fray, to, yeah, to go for it. This was a breeze. The hardest one was to get everybody to say yes to the first one because it was really the, it had been four years and do we risk coming back? And, you know, everybody was so iconic after it went off the air, it became a bigger and bigger and bigger story. So there was a little apprehension to start up again, but this one was like, let's go, let's see what else can happen. And for me, that people talk about the pressure of writing it, but the pressure was never about the box office for me. It was about the audience. And can you tell a new story with the same familiar characters and do something completely different than the first movie? And yet stay true to them. Yes, and not disappoint that, the fans who no, have grown to love these girls. Who have grown with these girls, which I think, you know, one of the themes of the movie to me is evolution, the past, the present, the future, who Carrie was, who she is, who she will be. And I think the trick of this whole is that the fans seem to be evolving with these characters. Into, well, we're aging. Evolving is an like euphemism. For aging, it's a party it? way. Of, it's a pretty party way. I know how to deal with the ladies. You're evolving so beautifully. Why? Thank Why you look you. so much younger than the last time I saw you evolve, Katie? <laughs> you know, I've seen you evolve for a while. You don't even know this, but you know, I wrote for you. When you did Murphy Brown, I wrote the episode that you were on Murphy Brown's Baby Shower. You did? I actually wrote the line because I had to write it, and I, it was one of my first big shows, and I actually wrote your entrance line, and Murphy opened the door and said, oh, it's one of those anno annoying Katie Curry looks like. Look, look, see, now you know what I'm an actor. I had a stroke since then in my evolution. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, I've had some sort of small stroke since this afternoon. One of those annoying Katie Couric lookalikes. Yes, and you were very good in it. Really? That I was, was at the beginning of your rise to power. I, I was really, really nervous during doing well, that show. you know, show. that's when I realized that it, it, they're so interesting. There's a fine line between being yourself and being yourself on film, and you did a great job. Well, you know, and I thought, I think, I don't know if you wrote my line, but she opened up her gift that mm -hmm. I brought to the baby shower, mm -hmm. and all these other female anchors mm -hmm. were there, mm -hmm. and she opened up, and it was a pair of golf shoes, mm -hmm. and I said, oh my God, Bryant Gumbel's at his birthday party opening up a breast pump. Breast pump! <laughs> right? Did you Thank write that? Thank you. Yes, breast pump. <laughs> Just it has, to say breast it has pump a signature MPK. Breast pump. <laughs> wait for a laugh. Anyway, so yeah, so we have a long evolution yeah, as well. Yeah, definitely. But well, they thank have you aged. for giving me the funniest line, by the way. Oh, I think you demanded it. Thank you. I think you backed <laughs> me into a corner and said, "Come here, kid. <laughs> yeah. I need the funniest of all these ladies." Did my Betty Davis thing. <laughs> right. All right, enough about me. Let's talk about you. How does an Irish Catholic boy from mm. Scranton, PA? Yeah end up writing about four Cosmo swilling, Manolo wearing Manhattanites. I mean, how did this happen, seriously? I don't know. I'd been toiling in the writing uh, plays and doing comedy, stand-up comedy for a while. And of course, I have three sisters and a mother, so I already was born knowing that women were my friends. They were weren't a different species altogether, different right? Species. No, but actually the same in a weird way. Not separate, not like, 
oh, the girls belong in the kitchen and the boys belong over there, or there's a split. And of course I'm gay, so there was like, uh, can I play with your Barbies? No, okay, I'll see you in 20 <laughs> can years. Can I borrow that dress? <laughs> no, never wanted the dress. <laughs> now I have a couple of dresses. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple of dresses thrown my way in the movie. <laughs> but the reality is I sort of saw my sisters as equals. So I think that might be the fundamental door that opened for me where I like women very much. And also, I think, you know, women tell you how to write them. They're very verbal. They express their feelings. They have very vivid emotions. So if your job as a writer is to write what you're writing about, women are very clearly defined for me. Now, did you create Sex in the City? No, Candace Bushnell wrote the book. Right. No, no, Darren no, no I Star know that. Took the Darren book, Star, right? Took the book to HBO. I was hired as soon as the series started, and Darren and I did the first season and the second season. Then Darren went on to other shows, and I stayed. And every year, I plucked a different, amazing woman writer from the world that I would discover, so that by the end of the series, I was writing it with six very smart, very funny women. I remember I met Cindy Shupak, Cindy Shupak yeah. once when I was uh, doing the Today Show and just thought she was terrific. They're I think she bright. had written a book or something. Yeah, and she had and now I always look and see when it says written by Cindy Shupak yeah, on yeah. the episode. They're all very special. And what was great about the evolution of the series is everybody kept, every year we met and we would throw all our heartbreaks on the table and all our embarrassing sexual stories on the table. And then we'd sort of tweak and figure out who could be what. We added some invention and then some good storytelling and it became this other thing. Why do you think it became this other thing? I mean, why do you think, it seems so unique to me in terms of shows that I watch and resonate mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. um, I still go home and if I'm really tired and just want to kind of be uh, entertained, I'll go, you know, to HBO On Demand. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they only run like one season at a time, which bums me out. That's how but they get you. I know. So I'll watch a, a repeat, even though I've seen it at mm -hmm. least 17 times. I mean, what is it? I, first of all, I think the word unique is what you said in your description of it. I think it's an original. I think it hadn't existed before this moment. No one had said that. I mean, you know, the big fireworks display that started it all was sex and women talking about sex with a comic edge versus like, oh, I had sex and I'm ashamed, but more bold. And I think it was uh, current and fresh and original. And that's sort of compelling. And it goes one or two ways when something is original. It's either catches on or people don't understand it. And this had a very nice, slow creative process mm -hmm. and people got more and more hooked and the actresses help. The actresses are amazing and they've shaded these archetypes to the point of like believability and then the writing just keeps going further and why I think it endures if it does is because I refuse to repeat. I won't go backwards and we never made the mistake of freezing them and saying pretend you're 37 and you're all single still. We let them evolve, we let them uh, grow and be both comic and tragic. It defines description. I mean, there, some episodes are funny, and, and within one episode, you can be laughing at a sex story, mm -hmm. devastated by Carrie's mistake, feel pathetically, you know, related to, to Miranda, who doesn't have a date and, won't, and keeps ordering from the same Chinese place every week. And <laughs> yeah, they laugh. and they laugh the at lady her. laughs. That they was laugh the funniest episode. That happened episode. to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then she goes down, it's just a lady with a sense of humor, and it's not a personal No, it's attack. a lady just laughs inanely she's a, she's all the insane. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she doesn't have a sense of humor, she just laughs. She's insane. Yeah. But she takes it personally. So we took everything personally on the stories, and I think people wanted to see some other personal people risking some stuff in their life. And the dialogue, I think, it's so fun because they're all so smart. That's what I, I love about it. It's just I always feel like they're always, I mean, I never feel, once in a while I do, they're too clever by half. But most of the time, I feel like they're actually having a conversation and one of them might really say, say, something, funny. say something really funny and clever. I, I agree. I think that one of the great tricks of writing uh, comedies is to give the sense of humor to the people so that when a joke comes out it's actually shared by the group it's like Miranda said something funny and Carrie's a writer so she can always be a little clever by half right but you know over the years I've taken jokes out of their mouths when they've sounded like jokes and Sarah Jessica's phenomenal she can make anything play and if ever I would hear her stumble on a joke I would take it out because I realized it was a joke. It wasn't Carrie's sense of humor. Would she ever say, you know what, this just doesn't sound like me. I don't feel comfortable no, with this. Would, no, she would die trying. Were you guys trying. sort of have she a Vulcan mind melt? Constantly. 
she would die trying to get the joke. And if it stumbled, I would say, oh, that's a joke. And she'd say, give me, give me, another, run, give me another run at it, coach. I know I can get that joke. And I was like, that's the point. You don't need a joke. You need a, a behavior. You need a reality. Right. So we would take jokes out. But the writing was very important to me. And the writing, uh, somebody said to me, women don't really talk like this. And I said, well, they would if they had a writing staff. That's all. <laughs> Get a writing staff. Some women do a little bit, just a probably lot. not not as consistently, right? Not as right? consistently or not as uh, succinctly. Not when they're PMSing. <laughs> not as succinctly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, sometimes, believe me, I've been in the writing room. Sometimes a story point goes on for hours and hours, and you think, we got to move along now. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't call you back. I get it. <laughs> Now we got to get on to another story. Let me ask you a little bit about the second movie, because I know you said the first Sex in the City film was about crying in the dark with Carrie. Yeah. So, and it was pretty dark. It was pretty depressing at times, obviously. Hello. I like the wound. I like the bruise. I like that, that sometimes you go to an audience, and particularly this audience goes to like uh, push on the bruise a little bit. You know that good feeling of like when it hurts a little bit? And no, you're crying? actually. <laughs> you do, Katie. I don't like in, people to push on my bruise. No, not in reality. <laughs> yeah. I won't be pushing on your bruise physically. I won't be leaving the chair <laughs> to you. prove Thank the point, you. Katie. I'm talking about a sadness that like you want to cry. You know, and it feels good to cry for your friend who got hurt in a movie as long as it has an ending that's not like you're left in the dark. So I thought the first movie should be about a big romantic break, almost like a Jane Eyre movie, almost like a feeling of the epic journey of this marriage that blew up because she believed in being a bride. So I knew that that was the landscape. It was an emotional landscape. So the second movie, when I sat down to write it, I knew we were in an economic downturn. I knew that I'm not a banker. I can't go down to Wall Street and they go, I got it. Here's what you should say. That's not going to fix anything. But in the tradition of Hollywood, I thought I'm a movie maker. I can make a big, extravagant Hollywood getaway movie and take people on this big vacation. And in that same moment, have a completely different vibe. But the real vibe was when I saw women at the first movie watching it together in groups when I would go. They're dressed up, taking pictures of themselves in the theater. Like, <laughs> we're the show. And I thought, yeah, you are the show. It's like an interactive uh, art thing going on between your girlfriends and those girlfriends. So I wanted the party to continue. So that's why the, this movie has such a big vibration of fun, I think. So what would you call it in a nutshell if, if you I think could. it's emotional 3D. Yeah. I think it's like leaps off the, I think this is a road picture. This is a big, old-fashioned Hollywood movie with a contemporary heart. Like Bing Crosby like, and uh, I would who, say like the, the Road to who, Manolo yeah, instead yeah. of The Road to Morocco. Who, who was that? Bing, Bing Crosby, Crosby and, 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 and Bob Hope. Bob Hope, exactly. As a matter exactly. of fact, there's a moment where Sarah Jessica is sitting on a camel in the Sahara Desert in this white bustier, which she got out of the archives. of Which everybody wears on their camel rides, right? That's the point. You don't have to because we do it for you. Yeah. We're jump Thank you. We're jumping out of the fashion plane without a parachute for you. So you can try it on. They're like living paper dolls. Like, oh, I would never put on the tossel bustier that she puts on and walks proudly across that dune. But she has on top of it this crazy sultan's turban. She has a pair of Ray-Bans and opera glasses on top of it. And if that's not Bob Hope, then in like every Bob Hope road picture, <laughs> To me, it was like old-fashioned contemporary couture. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Well, also, this film marks the return of, of an old fra flame. Frame. Frame. <laughs> frame. Of Carrie. You, I'm so excited. I can't talk. Everybody. Let's, ta let's take a look. I'm going back for more spices. I don't think I got enough. Okay. And there in the middle of old Abu Dhabi was an old love. Aiden. This is the best mirage that I've ever had. Abu Dhabi? What? You? Why? I'm here with the girls. Yeah, Samantha worked us all in on her free PR trip. And you? <laughs> I'm on the uh, third leg of a buy-in trip. Bali, India, here. Yeah, I import rugs to sell with the furniture, and I'm talking like... I don't know you. Come here again. <laughs> Holy moly. Oh. And doesn't everyone wear their J'adore Dior shirt in Abu Dhabi? I don't. 
you know what I wear? A look of pain, concern. Are we going to get the day? I mean, what is that, that outfit, that, by that the way? Outfit is the, that's the killer. You've seen the killer outfit. There's one outfit that when Pat Field shows it to me, I go, yeah, that is special. And the fact that I was talking to Sarah Jessica about this, that outfit, she said, it's the closest I've ever gotten to feeling like I'm in a Merchant Ivory movie. And what's <laughs> funny about it is it's a totally inappropriate but stunning outfit. And what's interesting about it, besides that skirt, which is impractical, and the T-shirt, what she's wearing on top of the T-shirt is a... Actually a pair of pants. <laughs> No, I was you're going to tell me something like that. What? It's a small chimp. No, it's a it's a shirt because the arms and the shoulders in the Middle East are considered, as you know, ver forbidden. Right. So I had this dialogue with Patricia Field, the t designer. She kept saying she put them in halters, and she, and I kept saying, Pat, shoulders. She goes, Well, they're on vacation. And I said they can't be. So she starts. That's a t. That's a shirt buttoned and changed into some sort of a jacket. It's like a origami moment. Well, you know, if anybody but Sarah Jessica Parker no. tried that on, they would look like buffoons. They you know would, that. But she pulls it off. She here's... does, and it's actually kind of annoying. I have to be honest that... with you, because sometimes I think, oh, I'm going to try to look a little chic and hip. And Well, but Carrie doesn't look chic and hip. Carrie no, looks like does. Carrie. But she looks so cool. Cool. And that's the really the, meth the message behind Carrie, really, which is be an individual. And, you know, in the movie, it starts with these, these really quick 80 flashbacks, like what they look like. And, it's, and you see her in flash dance clothing. And then you see her as Madonna. And the idea is, as a young girl, she, whatever trend she grabbed to. And now she's creating her own trend, which is kind of the message of Sex and the City. Create your own life. Yeah. And, well, that's... Well said. It's true. Let me ask you uh, about Aiden, since that was the original mm -hmm. question. Someone actually tweeted us, Tony Chanicus. Is that and with a, a, an <laughs> I and a dot above it, or is it a T-O-N-Y, like Tony? No, Tony it's, wants it's, to it's, know. It's, it's Tony with an I. It's so a lady. I think it's a girl. So why did Aiden come back? Because the movie, to me, one of the themes of the movie is uh, time. The past, the present, and the future. And Carrie Bradshaw has a moment in this movie where she's looking at who she is in the present, and she's wrestling with this title of wife, always known as the uh, you know eternal single girl. And now here is this traditional role still being handed to women today. It doesn't matter what your job is, how old you are when you get married, if you have kids, if you don't. Here you are. Now you're a wife. And it, it starts to make her look at who she used to be in her past. And when I knew I was going to open the door to the past, there's one person standing in there, which is Aiden. What about Burger? Well, that's you. Are you the Burger Girl? You know, I'm more Burger than Aiden. Well, I have you know, to be that is really you. interesting because you are a rare species. You should be put in the Smithsonian. There are very <laughs> for many other reasons. <laughs> yeah, in a glass yeah. bell. Because I've been evolving for so long. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, mod the, really? mo the modern wing. Are, are I'm putting women, you. In are women really into Aiden? Two people in the show have loomed big. And when I say to women, they like Sex and the City, I say one question, Big or Aiden, Mr. Big or Aiden splits right down the middle, and occasionally there's a mutant strain like you who gets to and goes, I like burger, but here's what's interesting, I do Katie. like burger, though. Every, I mean, he's tortured, and he's every, got issues, and he needs a good, good therapist, but I think he's the cutest, the I have to say. I think Aiden's kind of dull, I have to be honest with you. Oh, my with God. You. I feel like tipping you over in your at chair over there, just like, boom, for all the Aiden ladies. You are gonna, I'm sorry. You think you're getting tweets now. <laughs> Wait I know, I can see he's kind of mellow and organic and, you know. But that's what I'm saying. There is a very strong Aiden lady out there who likes a man who is supportive and there and present. And then there's the Mr. Big ladies. And I'm going to get to you in a second, <laughs> mutant strain. Uh, there's the Mr. Big ladies who like the challenge. And then you like the interesting sort of puzzle guy. Berger was the most realistic of all the men we wrote reflecting in all the women in the writing room. They all had a burger and what <laughs> had a fry. They had a hot dog too. <laughs> they all had a burger in their life. And what was funny is we brought burger in and I, I basically said, you're, you're being brought in to be a, an assassinated man because we knew what was going to happen. Was he okay with that? He was is, okay. Is he until, scarred for life? Until he saw the first movie and Ron Livingston, who's a brilliant actor, yeah. said to me, oh, I was a little upset I wasn't in the first movie. And I said, well, I was a little upset you broke up with her on a post-it. Yeah. What am I going to exactly. do? Bring you back? <laughs> yeah. You're well, lucky didn't he I did think he came back after the posted episode, didn't he? He disappeared into oh, the okay. night. Oh, okay. So when he saw her in the Hamptons, that was before, before the posted. Before the okay. That's when it was still nice. You know, nice. when you watch so many reruns out of order, you get a little confused. But it plays. It's, it yeah. keeps it mixing it up for the kids. <laughs> Chelsea Handler wrote in her latest book her reaction to the first Sex in the City movie. I, I don't know this, but I'm sure. I, let me buckle up. Okay. She said, Big just stood up 
Carrie at the altar, she writes, I hated Big. I hated everything about him in this storyline. I wanted Big dead. A lot of people did agree with mm -hmm. with Chelsea, mm -hmm. who's really funny, by the way. Oh, she's you should fantastic. have her in the next movie. Yeah, that's true. But great. after you have me, of next course, you're the but, next in line. But why did Carrie take Big back? I mean, Carrie is sort of if she's, I mean, she, she's such a, uh, uh, what what can I say? She's such a mixed bag. Carrie is. I that's think what personality I love about her. wise, because she's, a mixed she's bag. so insecure and dependent, and yet fiercely independent in some ways. That's but, that's the that's the joy of the character. And what I like about the Carrie Big story in the first movie is that it was tragic and it was unforgiving. But people make huge mistakes. And what I like about Carrie Bradshaw is she believes that that's the love that she is meant to have. And he eventually did come around. From the writing point of view, I can prove how he came around and it took six months and he was there for her unassumingly and he went and found her way back by going through books and writing her a love letter, which is a nice sort of homage to the change that he made. And in this movie, when you see it, I'm, I, I'm really happy about Big in this movie because I know that there's a gauntlet on the ground. People are like, I hate Big, which I like it. Because it gives me something to do. Like, I got to win them or, or kill them or do something with the. I like that they have such real reactions. It's more than a movie to people. And that's what's thrilling about writing it. Because I know that there are um, Charlottes out there who are waiting for Charlotte's story. And there's Mirandas out there who are like, oh, thank God you took Steve back. And it's so thrilling to be involved in something that people actually believe is important to them. And they really do relate so much to the characters. I know, and I think they're what, for whatever reason, you're just brilliant at touching something that has touched everybody. And as you said, you know, they we've all been dumped by a burger. Oh my God. Not we've... necessarily on a post it. No, no, I've I, had other ways. I don't think that's <laughs> Of course. What, one of the stories we did with Miranda, when the Burger Post-it story came out, she came down and she said, I, I, a guy once had his doorman break up with me, which oh, I yeah. thought was so sex in I, the city. I think she, you actually used that in yeah, a show. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for At, Miranda. Oh, oh, and that was a real story? Yeah, a real story. Oh, funny. All right. So, um, okay, we got to get through these questions. Do you think Carrie's a feminist? Yes. Because she follows her individual path, and she does what's right for her. And our but whole she's belief... Sort of, I, I think she feels like she's nothing without a man. I disagree. Oh. I feel that she is finding out what's right for her, which I believe uh, is what basically choice is about. I mean, and there is a villain in Sex in the City always, and it's not a man. It's society. And what society tells you should do. And if you get trapped by how you want a man, it's usually because society is telling you you should have one by now. So I like that there's a villain in this, in all of the Sex and the Cities in its tradition or society. Or expectations, right? Yeah. Either way. Whatever. And I, and sometimes you're your own villain, which is great, too. Why Abu Dhabi is the setting? Because when I sat down to write the movie, I knew I wanted it to be extravagant. And I looked around and I thought, where is the place where there is not a financial crisis right now? And what's cutting edge in terms of like a destination? And Samantha's storyline is the thing that gets them there. And she's a publicist. And the PR spin of the New Middle East was fascinating to me. And they call it the future. So I thought, let's go to the future if I'm doing a story about the past as well. In a column from the UK Guardian, a writer named Nicholas McGeehan takes on the choice saying, quote, in contrast to the image it attempts to project globally, the UAE is a country where human rights are systematically violated and where women are routinely discriminated against. Mm -hmm. So were you in a way trying to make a statement about that or did you just not do your homework? Oh, I did my homework. I actually went to Abu Dhabi in Dubai. And yeah, well, did it strike you as to have four kind of independent, strong women go going to a country that was so repressive at first? Did you say, hmm? Uh, actually, or did it make it more interesting? Actually, first of all, the first thought of this movie was not political. It was about an adventure. And I am a writer and I wanted to explore the idea of tradition and even in a contemporary city like New York, how Carrie Bradshaw is struggling with tradition. But mostly, I wanted to do something that was new and fresh and current. I don't believe it's a political movie. I think Samantha's as, and also as a writer, the idea of sexually liberated Samantha in the Middle East, you cannot take the smile off my face. Because I know there's something there that, that is a push and a pull of energy that will be comic in my comedy movie. But it's with great respect, as I have gone there a couple of times as a writer, and every detail of what happens that is respectful in this movie is because I experienced something that was quite respectful there. 
And it's what about, do you mean? Oh, uh, the way I was treated, the, 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 the culture that I experienced sitting down, learning from people. Well, that's interesting. Um, meanwhile, it's been 12 years since you entered Carrie's world, and yeah. she's no longer in her 30s. Samantha isn't even in her 40s, but man, she looks she good. She looks good, don't she? Ken Cottrell is... She is, she is. That's the thing. It's so amazing. I mean, seriously? That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. But, and, but, but, and you say you don't want to go backwards, but how do you make them, I hate to use the word age gracefully, but... Well, age first gracefully. of all, they are aging gracefully as physical beings. And I mean, I, I don't mean physically. I no, mean oh, sort of, story you know, wise, right? Yeah. The only way for them to not age gracefully would be to stunt them in their growth. The fact of the matter is there are, there are women aging heroically and gracefully all day long in the real world. And so the idea of Samantha Jones going through the change and refusing to change is, is interesting because she's not always graceful about it. She's human about it. And there's some fun stuff in here about bioidentical hormones, which is the cutting edge, and getting them or not getting them. And they're all aging because they're growing. But I would say ripening as well. Um, Calvin Collins tweets, how do you keep the actors excited about their scenes after so many years of playing the same roles? You don't give them the same scene ever to repeat. You give them new twists and turns in their storylines. Like Charlotte has two children now. Kristen Neighbors never played that dynamic before. Her story in this movie is a story she's never played before. Cynthia has something new to play. And really? Also, can you tell us what Yeah, well, she's, she's a working woman who suddenly doesn't have a job. Oh, did she get downsized? Uh, no, she downsized herself, which is a bigger story point. Oh, actually. so so she's she chose, adjusting. She, cho she chose to choose herself over uh, a difficult work situation. So you know, she's yeah, they were never that nice to her there, by the way. Well, no, well, you know, that's but I'm she glad she, she did rose that. and rose and rose and rose to the partnership, and then she takes a moment and she goes, "Really?" But you'll see when you see it. They're all sort of looking at a new sh version of themselves, and it's fun to see Miranda throw down her BlackBerry and be a fun girl. Who is your favorite character? I love Carrie Bradshaw because if you love Carrie Bradshaw. If you know Carrie Bradshaw, she's the backbone of the entire, from the writing point of view, you have to know what she's doing. It is funny, though, how everybody has a favorite character, I too. love that. You know, My daughter likes Miranda the best. That's fantastic, because, you know, very few people choose Miranda, but then very few people choose Berger. <laughs> Interesting family lineage. But seriously, Katie, the first time I thought, hey, this is growing in a weird way spectacular way is in the third season of the show I heard of a woman psychologist in London who conducted a seminar over a weekend but before about growth but before you joined it you had to declare yourself a Carrie a Miranda Samantha or a Charlotte and I guess the archetypes are clear and people are finding them do they do you think that yeah that's I interesting. think they find them and you know Margaret Cho who's a brilliant comedian was on the show she said I can't have one I have to have sex in the city zodiac so she says <laughs> you get like a rising sign and a main sign. So she said she was Carrie with a Samantha Rising. Ah. Who are you? I, I, I think I relate the most to Carrie. I do. Mm -hmm. um, Even though you think she's a bit of a mess. Yeah, Interesting, well, Katie. <laughs> is the upcoming sequel, uh, is it true that it had a clothing budget of $10 million? It's so beyond that, it's not even funny. It's undefinable. I mean, first of all, no one purchases the clothes. There's not some goon with a big wad of millions going on going, I'll take those two dresses and shoes. The clothes aren't purchased. They're on loan from brilliant designers all around the so globe. So do you have to give them back? They all go, I've seen the clothes taken off people. <laughs> In the last movie, there's a, a, a very simple but beautiful tie-dye dress when Carrie and Big are having their sort of like, but you said the wedding could get bigger fight. Yeah. We didn't finish it in one day. We had to come back and shoot it. But the dress was on a fashion shoot in Mexico. We put some intern on a plane, sent her to the jungles of Mexico, got the dress, put her back on the plane, and came back and shot it for a day. None of this is owned. It's all sort of returned or go archived for... The future. Because someone asked if, if the, you guys have an auction of the clothes and the a shoes. A lot of sometimes they're, what's left is the auctions go to really good uh, causes, like, you know, Katie Couric. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to get I you wish. that Shador t shirt <laughs> yeah. and that purple dress and see how you look in it. Yeah, I could put how it on How you feel in it would toe. be more important. Now, which character are you? Uh, I hate to say, but I'm all of them, including the men. Really? Yeah, but I'm Carrie. Carrie? I'm Carrie, but with a penis. Okay. Okay. Anywho. All right. Uh, let me ask you about uh, Samantha because she meets a, a Danish man in uh -huh. Abu Dhabi. Yes. No, she meets a, a Danish architect in Abu Dhabi. Uh, okay. Yes. I've rewritten Well, man, you. he's an art, right? I know. 
<laughs> Let's I got thrown by Abu Dhabi. In every Sex in the City, you know you say, is there a lot of pressure to write Sex in the City after you've had success? Yes, every time I sit down, there's pressure. And then the, there's all sorts of sub-little pressures. And this season, this ep movie was really the pressure to find a new couple of guys for Samantha because she's single. Right. So that implies sex. She's and the only fun one now. She's, she's <laughs> always going to be single one. And she's single. Not her, but, the, you know, she's single. But Max Ryan plays this stunning uh, Danish architect who's in Dubai. And it's, I know, all I know is the women that have seen the movie come out going, gah, 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 gah. Uh, truly? He's this year's Jill Marini. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, spoiler alert. Uh -huh. She doesn't marry him, right? Because there's some kind of, I guess, buzz, or she's been uh, seen. She's a, been spotted oh, in a the, wedding you, gown. You know that? You don't know this story? No. Kim said to me, first of all, there was all these stories that Carrie and Big split up, and she moved to London. And I was like, these are all very interesting <laughs> movies. Where were they when I was sitting in a room worrying? Yeah. It's all very exciting. But one of the things Kim said to me one day, she said, "I think we should. I should come to the set in a wedding gown sometime." Oh, and I just said, to, "Just to, to throw it." And I said. Okay, and I left a trailer, and 45 minutes later, I see her crossing Fifth Avenue in a wedding gown, and I thought, today she's going to do Oh, that's I right, I read thinking. about that. Yeah. yeah, and it was total, her and Pat Field got a wedding gown in 45 minutes, and it was just, and then of course, all the bloggers, Samantha's getting married. What a terrible idea. And it was a terrible idea, because I don't believe that any time all of them will ever be married, because that's not fair to the single girls. Do you see divorce in their future? I see. I don't see anything in their future. I just see what's on the screen right now. <laughs> that's a good idea. All right, a couple other quick questions. Your IMDb profile says you dropped out of college at age 20. Yes, I did. You look at you, you're like, yes, I did. I did. I was a theater major. <laughs> uh -huh. So some people would say I had dropped out of college when I declared myself a theater major. <laughs> Where were you? I was in Erie, Pennsylvania in a small, small college that no one's ever heard of. I think it was called Go Ahead and Drop Out of Us. <laughs> university. But I didn't have any money. And I was like in theater and I was taking dance classes. And I thought, hey, if, if the back position on this career is teaching, it's never going to be because I went to this school. And if ever I want to teach, it would only be because somebody would let me teach because of something I achieved post-college. So I went to New York and had immediate success as a waiter for the next 17 years. <laughs> and then you started writing for... And then, I, and then I started as a playwright. And that was a very waiter situation as well. And then I wound up uh, going to Hollywood to write a sitcom. And my first one was Murphy Brown. That was a good sitcom. It was a good one. It was, like going, such a it was really show. like going to Yale for sitcom writing. I mean, if you got on Murphy Brown, there were only five writers. And Diane English was a brilliant, brilliant showrunner. If you got on that show, it was like, kid, you made it. And it was a really smart, interesting show. And, and all about the writing. And then it's interesting that I've been able to maintain, then I was actually on this first season of Will and Grace. I've been able to Love maintain that show shows too. that are about writing. And Candace Bergen, of course, was mm. on and several was episodes. Enid. Of, and she was in yeah. the first movie, yes. That is, was a, is Enid sort of who Carrie is afraid of becoming? Yeah, I think so. I think that's an interesting sort of a cautionary tale. And um, the interesting thing about Enid is that she appeared way before there was any sort of uh, Devil Wears Prada editor at Vogue. And, and it was kind of a beautiful trick to have Candace do it because she is effortlessly authentic. That's what we try to do in every casting. If you get someone who's really authentic, it seems how to be more believable. Why is it so hard uh, to, to replicate a show like well, like Murphy Brown and like Sex in the City. You I mean, know? there's an I... interesting thing that happened with this lightning moment. I, I think we had the right four ladies and the idea that the evolution, again, of the writing caught fire with the audience. But the characters are allowed to be both comic and tragic. Sometimes on network television, they worry too much about whether they're making mistakes. The fact that you sat here earlier and said Carrie Bradshaw's kind of a mess is the reason that you love her, is probably the reason you relate to her, because she's also a winning mess and sometimes a hero. So I think any arena, and I don't think this would have existed if it wasn't on HBO. I really don't, because we got to get your attention by talking about sex. But showing I'm sure sex. HBO would love to have a new show like this. I'm sure they will. You, I'm you sure, think? I think every, there will be another moment. There yeah. has to be. There's, this didn't exist before it existed. There'll have to be another moment. Everybody says TV is back. You know, we'll see. There'll be another moment. So before we leave you, We're leaving? this is so much fun, by My the pleasure. way. My um, pleasure. I love being at Katie Couric. <laughs>
guys, and it's very thrilling, it's isn't it? It's kind of like a, it looks like a breakfast treat over there, that at, like a Danish. <laughs> like a little, like a honey bun. Yeah, right? honey bun. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which the filet of the honey bun is the best part. Yeah, of course, because okay. you waste. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's throw, talk about. Because you're not eating it if you're going to I'm going to, I'm going to do these names, and you just tell me, quick, quick reaction. John Stewart. Delightful. You were here like very that. close. Very close friend. From your stand up days? Yeah, stand up days. Who knew? I, uh, yeah, me, I gave him his first writing job, but I'll give you one word for John Stewart. S- quick, confident interviewer. Great. So Sweetheart. Funny. Showed me pictures of his kids. Big yeah. heart. Big heart and intellect. Rare to get that together. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's a more very, than one word. That, no, that's okay. You can have more than one word. That's a very nice compliment. It's true. Patricia Field. Uh, Picasso. Really? Yeah, just an unprecedented, improvisational artist that does things her own way. Liza Minnelli. A star. Yeah. And actually not disappointing at all. Really? I mean, we sat down to ask her. I, I went with my producer, John Melfi, to ask her to do that. And I said to him, we're meeting Liza Minnelli. We sat down at lunch, and I said to him afterwards, if this had been a Liza Minnelli drinking game where you take a shot of something every time she says a Liza Minnelli thing, we would have been drunk within 10 minutes because she's really Liza Minnelli. It's authentic. And to see her do, she does this big number in the movie, and you cannot believe what you're seeing, that she's still Liza Minnelli. Candace Bergen, you already talked oh, uh, about her. Pure, pure, authentic thoroughbred. And still beautiful. Gorgeous. My husband used to think she was the most beautiful woman. Gorgeous. And I always thought that was so nice because it was she's smart and so beautiful. elegant and patrician. Yes, and yes. And I thought that was nice. If your husband thinks Candace Bergen is beautiful, she, he's a good man. She was like royalty. Yeah. But like the good kind of royalty where they know everybody who does the the game the, the gamekeeper and the gardener. I mean, she was royalty. Still is. Chris Noth. Is it Noth or Noth? Noth. Noth. Chris Noth is a man. And uh, for all that, it means he is an authentic man. He's irascible. And yet every now and then the clouds part and out comes this unbelievable Mr. Big confection. I don't know what it is. And are, are there reports that you're working on a deal with Warner Brothers? I just did a big, uh, I'm doing a new television company with Warner Brothers. And, uh, so a show's not good enough? You're doing a whole company? I'm doing a company, Katie. <laughs> so are, are you going to do It's going to be called at, at Michael Patrick King. That's a good title, by the way. Oh, somebody took you can, it. You can, Look you at can your little sparkle it. on your letters you back there. Thank it. you. I'm actually going to do, uh, I like television as well as movies. I want to keep uh, doing movies because I like the fact that they're big and gigantic and I learn new things. But I also love what television does does in terms of, as you said, having people fall in love with characters and comfort them when they come home at night. And to know that there's a story, a new story coming every week into your living room made just for you, it's kind of addictive. And when people like it, they really stick with it. And therefore, they go to the f- movie you made out of your TV series, and it becomes a female blockbuster. And then they go to, and you get to do a sequel. But it all came from the small screen. Do you think you'll do an, another Sex and the City movie? I have no idea. I didn't know what I was going to do the second one when we did the first one. We're like this crazy... You know, when I was an actor and I did Summerstock, I was the one guy who only worked on the part. And then at the last day, I had no job and no agent. I never sent out a picture or anything. So I kind of just do it all and don't think about tomorrow. Well, my, Michael Patrick King, I just love talking to you. My and, and good luck with the movie. Are you going to be bummed if it's not the mega hit the first one was? I guess I can't imagine it won't be. I don't be. know. I, I, I think it's, I don't know what's going to happen. I think it's going to wear well. No matter what happens box office wise, I think people are going to like it in the future a lot. Yeah. Over and over again. Well, good luck with it. And Thank you. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I'm happy. I can't wait for you to see it. Let me know. Okay, and please, can I have like just a little cameo in the next one? In anything. We can think of something. I'll get work a at the pharmacy. Uh, anything. Yeah, that's where I put you at the pharmacy with yeah. the pills. <laughs> anyway. uh, you, you want your pills? <laughs> you want your pills? I'm kind of a mess. I like the wrong guy. You want your Here pills? You want your pills? <laughs> Thanks to all of you, by the way, who submitted questions on Twitter and Facebook. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter, <clears throat> Mister. Uh, yeah, my I'm handle, one of your followers. My handle is at Katie Couric. And now, stay tuned for a message from the sponsor of our web show, Dove. 